The Corbett Report is brought to you by you. Your support makes The Corbett Report possible. Sign up for the subscriber newsletter or purchase a DVD at corbettreport.com slash support. You're listening to The Corbett Report. corbettreport.com Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of The Corbett Report. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you, as always, from the miserably rainy climes of Western Japan here on this 30th day of August 2013. Welcome to episode 279 of the Corbett Report podcast, Who's Really Behind the War in Syria? Well, as everyone knows by now, unfortunately, we are moving closer and closer towards a what is looking increasingly like a unilateral U.S. strike on Syria in the coming days. And while it might not be the full-scale invasion that some people are uh, preparing for, it will undoubtedly be a very provocative incident and one that could be exceptionally geopolitically destabilizing at a time when tensions are already running high between, for example, the U.S. and Russia on the brink of a G20 summit coming up in St. Petersburg next week that, again, can be a very destabilizing event. So we are on a knife edge in a number of different ways, and this is being recorded on the afternoon of August 30th, 2013 here in Japan. So by the time it gets to you, perhaps the missiles will already be flying. But the question that is on everyone's mind right now, not only the listeners to the alternative media and programs like The Corbett Report, but even people who generally get their information from the MSM, is why is this happening? What is this really about? Because one thing is absolutely certain to the vast majority of the public, in fact, the 91% of the American public, that as in a recent poll uh, indicated, to have nothing whatsoever to do with this strike on Syria, the real question is, what is this really about? Because it certainly is not about chemical weapons. There is no doubt here that chemical weapons were used on a massive scale on August 21st outside of Damascus. There is also very little doubt, and should be no doubt, for anyone who approaches this logically, that the Syrian regime is responsible for the use of chemical weapons on August 21st outside of Damascus. It appears Americans don't want an intervention. Here's what a latest poll has just revealed. Just 9% of the U.S. citizens who were taking part in the survey want their president to act, while about 60% say that America should stay away from the civil war. When asked about Washington's support for the opposition, about one-tenth said that Obama should do more for the rebels than just arming them, while almost 90% don't want America to help the opposition in any way. While many Western leaders call for a military strike in Syria, some of their citizens are opposed to a costly military intervention at a time of economic austerity at home. A group of demonstrators gathered outside the Prime Minister's office in London after Britain sought UN backing for action against the Syrian government. But they're going to make it worse. They're going to ruin it. And they're going to make it like, like Iraq. And we don't want it to happen there. We don't want Syria to be the same as Iraq. The indiscriminate slaughter of civilians, the killing of women and children and innocent bystanders by chemical weapons is a moral obscenity. By any standard, it is inexcusable and despite the excuses and equivocations that some have manufactured, it is undeniable. All the U.S. brings behind is death and destruction. It's the United States, which is the most genocidal, murdering regime which has ever existed on the face of this planet. What's happened has been heartbreaking, but uh, when you start talking about chemical weapons uh, in a country that has the largest stockpile of chemical weapons in the world, uh, where over time their control over chemical weapons may erode, where they're allied to Uh, known terrorist organizations that in the past have targeted the United States, uh, then there is a prospect, a possibility, in which chemical weapons uh, that can have devastating effects uh, could be directed at us. 
protesters rallied outside Downing Street on Wednesday against possible British military intervention in Syria, as Prime Minister David Cameron recalled Parliament to discuss the response to the alleged use of chemical weapons against civilians by the Syrian regime. So the weapons inspectors are in the midst of their work and will be reporting in the coming days. That is why today could not have been the day when the House was asked to decide on military action. For this House, it is surely a basic point. Evidence should precede decision, not decision precede evidence. It is clear to me that the British Parliament, reflecting the views of the British people, does not want to see British military action. I get that, and the government will act accordingly. When even members of the British Parliament are calling out your war propaganda for what it is, I think you have a PR problem on your hands. And that is exactly what the Western allies of the imperialist war hawk faction have on their hands right now, trying to sell this war to a public that is very weary and wary of interventions in Middle Eastern countries after the debacles of the past decade, and the complicity of the corporate mainstream dinosaur media in all of these adventures abroad. So I think the public is definitely waking up to this, and I don't know about people's personal experiences out there, but from what I've seen in basically every website that I've seen these types of stories being posted on, including the dinosaur mainstream media websites, comment after comment after comment is is calling out this propaganda for what it is. And that is a hardening sign. People really are waking up to the tricks and I'm seeing more and more people, even in mainstream discourse, raising the possibility of maybe this was a false flag. And there's a lot of good reasons for for believing exactly that. And in fact, I'll throw a link in the show notes for today's episode to an oilprice.com website link um, that, that talks specifically about the reasons that not only was this almost certainly a false flag chemical attack to be blamed on Assad, but actually perpetrated by the terrorists in Syria, but that the U.S probably knew about it in advance. And that's an interesting article coming from a a relatively mainline site like oilprice.com. So I will throw that link in so you can take a look at that. But again, it raises the question of if this is not about the cartoon politics of the chemical weapon strike that uh, almost certainly did not come from Assad, then what is this really about? What is the entire conflict in Syria really about? And this is where we start really digging into some very interesting information, and it is, well, quite complex in in some ways, um, but I think it breaks down in a way that everyone can understand, and that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to break down the different pieces of this puzzle, starting with a clip for that I think will probably be familiar to most of the audience by now. It's a clip of General Wesley Clark, the retired four-star U.S. general who was also the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO back in 1999 during the Kosovo war crimes that NATO committed at that time, who back in 2007 made waves by talking about a plan that he overheard in the bowels of the Pentagon in the days after 9-11, about a plan to invade seven countries in five years, and some very familiar uh, countries appeared on that list, including Iraq, including Libya, and including Syria. So this speech has made the rounds quite a bit in the last few years, and tends to come up every time there seems to be new talk about invading one of these countries that are on this list. So let's take a short listen to this clip where General Wesley Clark talks about what he overheard at the Pentagon. I went downstairs, I was leaving the Pentagon, and an officer from the Joint Staff called me into his office and said, I I want you to know, he said, sir, we're going to attack Iraq. And I said, why? He said, we don't know. He said, uh, I said, well, did they tie Saddam to 9-11? He said, "Uh, no. And then I came back to the Pentagon about six weeks later, I saw the same officer. I said, why uh, why haven't we attacked Iraq? We still going to attack Iraq? He said, oh, sir, he says, it's worse than that. He said, um, he pulled up a piece of paper off his desk. He said, I just got this memo from the Secretary of Defense's office. It says we're going to attack and destroy the governments in in seven countries in five years. We're going to start with Iraq, and then we're going to move to Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. I said, "Seven, seven countries in five years. I said, is that a classified memo? He said, yes, sir. I said, well, don't show it to me. He was about to show it to me. He said, because I want to talk about it. The purpose of the military is to to, to start wars and change governments. It's not to sort of deter conflict. This country was taken over by a group of people with a policy coup. Wolfowitz and Cheney 
and Rumsfeld, and you could name a half dozen other collaborators from the Project for a New American Century. They wanted us to destabilize the Middle East, turn it upside down, make it under our control. Now, I think a little too much has been made of this speech in alternative media circles of late, at least this go around in the lead up to the impending strike on Syria, because there are a number of things that we should be skeptical about regarding this testimony from Clark. Not only the fact that he is a retired four-star U.S. general and the former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, so I think we should take everything he says with a grain of salt, but also, even if he is reporting accurately what he overheard about a classified memo that he never even saw, uh, we should keep in mind that this was coming out of the uh, Rumsfeld Pentagon in the wake of 9-11, so this is something that he overheard 12 years ago, and this was supposedly a five-year plan that was meant to kick off with the invasion of Iraq. The invasion of Iraq did take place in 2003, which would mean that this five-year plan would have been instituted and completed by 2008, which, of course, it was not. Also, it does seem that he was giving a chronological order to the invasions that were supposed to take place under this plan, starting with Iraq, then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off with Iran. And assuming that that's the order that, that this was all supposed to take place in under this classified memo, um, well, that hasn't taken place either. So we should be skeptical about this and not make too much about this supposed five-year plan that, again, we have no documentation of and we're just taking General Clark's word for it. But I think the more important part of this is the underlying policy that seemed to be at play here and what was really part of this stri strategy for reshaping the Middle East that very much was part of the agenda of the, the Bush-era Pentagon under Rumsfeld, and of course uh, directed by the, the policy planners and Iraq war policy planners of the Project for a New American Century. And when we look at the people who were in the bowels of the Pentagon really planning all of this, we're looking, of course, at people like Paul Wolfowitz and Douglas Faith and Richard Pearl, and others who obviously and documentably have extensive ties to Israel, with, in fact, people like Wolfowitz and Faith being actually investigated for their parts in spying for Israel in the past. So we don't have to go out on too much of a limb to say that there was a very uh, concerted Zionist agenda behind the project for a new American century and its quest to reshape the Middle East. And Israel's designs on Iraq have been well known and well understood for a long time. But uh, I think we have to see all of these invasions and overthrows and all of the destabilization in the Middle East in recent years as part of a grander Zionist project for reshaping the Middle East that we can say not only predates that five-year plan that General Wesley Clark talks about, but predates it by decades at the very least, documentably and on the record. So let's take a look at part of that record. And we're going to take a look at an important document that you can find out more about at an article that was posted on uh, globalresearch.ca in March of this year called Greater Israel, the Zionist Plan for the Middle East. And this talks about the Oded Yunon Plan, which was something that was developed in a document that was published in 1982 in the journal called Directions that's published by the Department of Information for the World Zionist Organization. And this document was translated into English by the Association of Arab American University Graduates. So I will put the English translation in the links for the show notes uh, for today's episode. So you can go and read this document for yourself directly. I think it's a very eye-opening document going back again, well, actually three decades now um, to Israel's uh, bigger foreign policy and its, its plans for basically breaking and carving up the Middle East in order to uh, institute this greater Israel idea. And it lays this out in some detail, but let's just take a look at uh, just the operative part of this document talking about what uh, the, the Israeli plans for Syria was in this World Zionist Organization document. And it says, quote, the dissolution of Syria and Iraq later on into ethnically or religiously unique areas, such as in Lebanon, is Israel's primary target on the Eastern Front in the long run, while the dissolution of the military power of those states serves as the primary short-term target. Syria will fall apart, in accordance with its ethnic and religious structure, into several states, such as in present-day Lebanon, so that there will be a Shiite Alawi state along its coast, a Sunni state in the Aleppo area, another Sunni state in Damascus hostile to its northern neighbor, and the Druzes who will set up a state, maybe even in Argolan, and certainly in the Hauran and in northern Jordan. 
This state of affairs will be the guarantee for peace and security in the area in the long run, and that aim is already within our reach today." End quote. Yes, peace and security as defined by the Zionists of the Israel foreign policy planning community, i.e. peace and stability for Israel. And certainly it does absolutely play into Israel's interests to keep the Middle East area divided ethnically uh, and religiously and get those uh, different sects fighting with each other because that obviously makes for the command uh, for the divide and conquer strategy that has been the go-to strategy for would-be imperialists and tyrants for millennia. Millennia, and it certainly does serve Israel's foreign policy purposes to keep the uh, the Muslims fighting amongst the, each other along their religious and sectarian lines, rather than fighting against Israel. And that's exactly, lo and behold, what is happening in Syria, as we see the Sunni majority fighting against the uh, Alawite sect, that the minority that has been in power under Assad and under his father for decades now in Syria. And it is interesting to see not only, of course, the native inhabitant Sunnis of Syria, but of course all the foreign-funded jihadists who are being shipped into the country who are fueling this very conflict. And in fact, if people go back to my um, interviews on RT back at the very start of this Syrian uprising, back uh, two, two and a half years ago now, you'll see that I made this point specifically that part of what this is all about is the destabilization of the Shia land bridge, the so-called land bridge that connects Iran all the way to its Hezbollah forces in Lebanon through that Shia land bridge that runs through Syria. But if that can be destabilized and the Shia Alawite sect minority that rules Syria can be replaced with a Sunni majority um, ruling over the country, uh, then that would break up that, uh, that, uh, that link th between Iran and Lebanon and would further destabilize and isolate Iran on the path towards committing well, the, the ultimate strike on Iran. And this is something that can be seen in the po policy planning documents of various think tanks, such as the now infamous Which Path to Persia document from the Brookings Institution, which Tony Cartolucci of Land Destroyer Report has written about so much. So there are definite geopolitical interests for Israel and its adjunct to the United States in the Middle East in keeping Syria divided against each other. And that is a very key part in what's taking place there in Syria. But... That isn't all. Surprisingly enough for people for in the United States, there are other factors in the Middle East other than the United States and Israel. And there are other players who are trying to become regional players in various different degrees as a result of this. And of course, in that regard, we have to look to some of Syria's neighbors and some of the other people in the region who are looking to step up, including Turkey and Qatar and Saudi Arabia, and how they all fit into this and, and what their part to play is in this Syrian drama. And as we start to expand the scope of this, of course, one of the things that as always in these Middle Eastern conflicts comes into play, is the resource wars that is always at least part of what's going on. So let's take a look at one of the interesting developments in recent years that has really, I think, uh, been one of the focal points for why it is so important to kick off the Syrian war now, and that is the prospect of an Iran-Iraq-Syria pipeline. Now, this is something that, in fact, has been on the table for a couple of years now, and just for more information on that, let's quickly turn to the Tehran Times from uh, July 26th of 2011, which had this story, Iran-Iraq Syria sign major gas pipeline deal. Iran, Iraq, and Syria have signed a deal for the construction of the Middle East's largest gas pipeline, which would transit Iranian gas from Iran's South Pars gas field to Europe via Lebanon and the Mediterranean Sea. According to the deal, Iranian gas will be transited to Greece and other European countries via a 6,000-kilometer pipeline crossing through Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, and under the Mediterranean Sea." End quote. Now, this is an exceptionally important pipeline because, as you might, might have noticed there, this gas is being transported from the Iranian South Pars field, the largest known uh, uh, gas field in the world, to uh, via Iraq, via Syria, through Lebanon, the Mediterranean, to Europe directly, which would mean Iranian gas going to Europe, which would be something that would be quite a boon for the increasingly isolated Iranian government, of course, 
and uh, and uh, one that would potentially upset the balance of power in the increasing moves towards isolating Iran, but also exceptionally significant because it bypasses, for example, Turkey, which has positioned itself as being the east-west energy crossroads where, uh, where all of these pipelines tend to transit through on their way to Europe. This would bypass Turkey altogether, so that would upset a uh, would-be regional power like Turkey as well. So this is an exceptionally important pipeline. Again, the memorandum of understanding on it has been inked and this has been moved just one step closer towards becoming a reality, which is another reason why this destabilization had to take place and why it is taking place. Now, this has been commented on by a number of uh, different analysts. So let's turn to one of my favorites, someone who has been a guest on this program before in the past and always has insightful analysis of these types of incidents. And I'm talking about F. William Engdahl, who of course is at engdahl.oilgeopolitics.net. I'll put the link in the show notes. Let's listen to a speech that he gave recently where he outlined exactly how this pipeline and the uh, the religious strife and sectarian strife in Syria play into the current destabilization of al-Assad's government. Well, the after the brutal military action in Libya to destroy that country, not just Gaddafi, but that country, the U.S. decided to move on to Syria. This is a long-term plan. It's been on the Pentagon war map for at least a decade to change the political map of the Middle East. And they thought they could roll into Syria on the momentum of Libya and destroy the al-Assad regime and bring in a Muslim Brotherhood opposition in Syria. Well, Syria is a country, if you look on the map uh, behind me, it's a country with many different religious minorities, Druze, Sunni is the majority, Alawite is a minority, Bashar al-Assad is an Alawite, his wife is a Sunni, and you have the Kurds. For many, many years, Syrian friends of mine have assured me, all different religious groups lived together side by side in a society that was basically uh, secular. There was no Alawite belief being forced on the Sunni majority by al-Assad or his father. Uh, and suddenly Syria was under attack. Now, the, if you go to the next slide, the next overhead, you'll see the critical location of Syria geopolitically in the Middle East. Syria borders Turkey, it borders Israel, it borders Lebanon, it borders Iraq. And in 2011, Bashar al-Assad's government signed a contract with the government of Iran and the government of Iraq to build a gas pipeline from the South Pars gas field, the largest gas field known in the world today, so that Iran could market its gas through Iraq, whose prime minister is a Shia Muslim, and through Syria, whose prime minister is an Alawite, but on friendly terms with both Iraq and with Iran. Iranian natural gas potentially, ultimately, into the European market, either through port locations in Syria or through Lebanon. Now, it begins at this point to get very geopolitically complicated, but basically when that agreement was announced by the Syrian government, the U.S. and NATO allies organized a massive dramatic escalation of the destruction of the al-Assad regime, accusing al-Assad of terrorism, accusing him of civilian atrocities, everything, the usual playbook that uh, is used by the State Department to demonize anyone they don't like. But in reality, the factor of this new pipeline 
created a major geopolitical uh, challenge, not just to the United States, but interestingly enough, to Israel, which in 2010 had discovered a huge, for the first time in Israeli history since 1948, a huge offshore gas field called Leviathan in the Eastern Mediterranean. And Israel began nursing ambitions of becoming an energy superpower, tiny little Israel, which hadn't had any energy to speak of of its own until then. So together with an American company, Noble Energy, a, an Israeli-American consortium began developing the Leviathan field, and another Middle East country called Qatar also began emerging as a major exporter of liquefied natural gas from another part of the field in the Persian Gulf that's adjoining to the Iranian field. Unfortunately, I don't have a map to show, uh, show that. But the same gas field that was discovered in Iranian exclusive economic zone waters in the Persian Gulf uh, extends over to Qatar. And the Qataris, with help of the British uh, energy companies, developed the liquefied natural gas technology to market this to Asia and ultimately to Western Europe. So, not surprisingly, much of the financing for the mercenaries, and they're not, they're not opposition for the most part, these are mercenaries. I, I was in Tehran in, in February of this year and interviewed a number of journalists who spent months all across Syria interviewing mercenaries, Al-Qaeda, uh, and, and others uh, fighting against the regime. They are paid a hundred dollars a day, which is a king's fortune for many of these uh, poor, unemployed uh, people from the... Well, they're coming from Chechnya, they're coming from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Libya, where they had excellent combat experience. Uh, and they're given Kalashnikovs and a hundred dollars a day and told to go in from the Turkish border into Iraq and create terror. And that through the chaos and terror they're told we'll back you up and uh, create a regime change against this evil Bashar al-Assad regime. So the financing to the tune of some five billion dollars for these mercenary terrorists came from the Emir of Qatar. So this is starting to get complicated, but hopefully the bigger picture is starting to emerge in that we have now a number of different parties who are interested in making sure that this Iran-Iraq-Syria pipeline does not go through. Not only Turkey, as I discussed before, but also Israel, which now wants to position itself as an increasingly important energy exporter because of its Leviathan gas field, and uh, also Qatar, which is interested in destabilizing Syria. So Qatar has been one of the uh, one of the places that has been funding the uh, the hiring of the jihadist mercenaries and shipping them into Syria to cause part of the destabilization that's going on there. So we're seeing a lot of different agendas overlapping in trying to make sure that this Iran-Iraq-Syria pipeline doesn't take place in the way that, uh, that has been planned, and also to make sure that the Assad government is not able to effectively govern Syria, that it basically gets split into these warring factions, exactly as what happened with Iraq, again, going exactly along with that Zionist Greater Israel project and the plan of carving up the Middle East into warring factions that could pose no serious threat to the peace and stability of Israel. So we're starting to see this coming together, and this is where it gets slightly more complicated, but infinitely more fascinating. And I'm going to turn to an absolutely fascinating interview that I conducted just yesterday with Pepe Escobar, of course, the roving correspondent for Asia Times Online at atimes.com, and someone that I often turn to as a absolute fount of uh, geopolitical knowledge. And he certainly did not disappoint in this latest interview. I will put the link in the show notes so that you can go and listen to the interview in its entirety. I suggest you do so because it truly does connect a lot of these dots. And the 
as I say, the picture becomes more complicated, but much more fascinating, as it turns out that, of course, Saudi Arabia also has its finger in the Syrian pie through the, uh, the, the figure in Saudi Arabian international politics who keeps cropping up again and again, even when we think he's dead, as recently was reported, even on the New World Next Week. And I'm talking about Prince Bandar, Bandar Bush, as he's probably more well-known to the listeners out there. And people who don't know much about his background, I'm hoping to put together a video report on that in the coming days and weeks, so um, I, I'll have more to say about that. But for people who do know Prince Bandar and who know that he was reported as being dead just a year ago and then popping up in Russia uh, with, in a picture with Vladimir Putin and now uh, being more and more implicated in what's happening in Syria, this is just an absolutely incredible piece of information. So let's turn to that interview with Pepe Escobar where he lays this out in relation to all of the other geopolitics and geostrategic interests that are coalescing in Syria. And I want to draw people's attention specifically to an article that was on Asia Times last month that I think was pretty prescient in that it uh, predicted that the uh, the status quo would have to be changed pretty soon. And that was a uh, an article called War Against Iran, Iraq, and Syria. And this concentrates on something that I think is a much more reasonable idea for what this is really about other than a chemical weapons attack, and that is the pipelines. As we've talked about on this program before, a lot of this comes down to the pipeline politics that is increasingly hardwiring geopolitical relations onto the grand chessboard. And this is no exception with uh, a memorandum of understanding having recently been signed between Iran, Iraq, and Syria for a new gas pipeline that really could potentially change the game if it was allowed to proceed. Let's tell people about this pipeline and uh, this memorandum of understanding that was just signed. Okay, this is absolutely essential. It's the Iran-Iraq-Syria pipeline, which uh, even some parts of the Middle East, uh, they call it, uh, with a little bit of sense of humor, in fact, the Islamic pipeline. Not exactly, right? But this is absolutely essential for two reasons. One, it bypasses two of the nations who are absolutely keen on regime change in Syria, Turkey and Qatar. The whole thing with Qatar, as we all know, changed completely for the past few weeks, in fact, for the past two months. Don't forget that until two months ago, Qatar was being hailed all over, not only in the Middle East, but even some parts of Europe and in D.C., as the next mini superpower. They were everywhere. Their foreign policy was everywhere. Their cash was everywhere. They were buying everything uh, legally, like a real estate in London and Paris, and illegally, like mercenaries all over the Middle East to fight in Syria. But then the Emir is gone. He deposes himself, which is a story that is absolutely impossible to confirm with any official sources in Doha. But we can get around it. We can talk to people in Iraq. We can talk to people in, uh, in the Emirates, uh, uh, you know, traveling Saudis, you name it. And the picture is that essentially he was invited to depose himself because of Saudi pressure. This Saudi pressure was applied by Bandar Bush, Bandar bin Sultan, former ambassador in Washington, uh, the capo of the old copy in the Afghan Jihad in the 1980s, uh, very close to the Bush family in the Carlisle group. We all know this story. So Bandar Bush was not dead. We saw that he had been dead for a year. We all remember that, since that attempt against him in July 2012. He resurfaced one year later, and his first photo, one year later, is shaking the hands of Vladimir Putin in Moscow. This is a story that I think a, a lot of people are already familiar with. Uh, the famous four hour and something meeting between Bandar and Putin, where essentially Bandar was trying to sell to Putin the idea that if you, if you start opposing uh, a UN resolution, uh, a UN Security Council resolution, and he backed off in terms of supporting Assad, well, uh, the Saudis would start buying, uh, for starters, $15 billion in Russian weapons with more contracts following. They would not interfere with, very important, pipelines, with uh, Russian pipelines uh, going to Europe, which means basically the North Stream and the South Stream, So, uh, which is ridiculous. And Putin already said that to Bandar straight away, look, we don't have a problem with that, unless you sabotage our pipelines, right? And... 
obviously after four and a half hours when uh, he was not getting what he wanted, which was uh, Putin's, okay, Assad is toast, he said, and uh, this is quoted verbatim from the leak. The leak was from a Russian diplomat. You went to, very funny, you went to an Arabic newspaper first, Al Safir in Lebanon, then it was translated into English, and then it was circulating all over. It's a completely crazy story. But uh, uh, it makes uh, the, uh, portions of the dialogue make sense completely, considering the way Bandar articulates himself and Putin's responses as well. Bandar, in the end, to sum it all up, he said, look, there's going to be a problem for you with uh, the Social Olympics. I'm going to release the jihadists that we control. He said blatantly, we control all these Chechens. And not only the Chechens who are in Syria or uh, trafficking between Iraq and Syria, but the Chechens in the Caucasus itself. And Bandar says explicitly, we run all these people, just like he ran 98% of the Mujahideen in the 80s in Afghanistan. So, uh, on the other hand, they had an agreement on Egypt, because Putin uh, is uh, very much afraid of the Muslim Brotherhood, all over, supported by Qatar, obviously. So, getting rid of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, in Egypt was okay for Russia. But this Assad, Assad business, forget it. The pipeline business, completely stupid because Russia is in control of all this. They have strategic partnership with Germany. They're building North Stream and the South Stream. Uh, there's no way the Saudis are going to interfere with that. And they don't even have, they don't even have uh, gas to sell to Europe. Qatar has gas to sell to Europe. And that's, that's the introduction for us to start talking about Iran, Iraq, Syria pipeline. So in the end, Bandar uh, threatened Putin, saying, literally, there's only a military solution for Syria left. This is what we are watching now. So this is the Saudi part of the BBB uh, axis, let's put it this way. Bandar, Bibi, and Barry, Obama. It's the three B axis, in fact. And uh, th This joke is, by the way, circulating all over the Middle East already, you know. So, uh, where, so what happened with Qatar? So, with Bandar pushing, pressing especially, the Obama administration telling, look, Qatar, it's ridiculous. In a phone call, he actually said, Qatar is 300 people at the TV station, which is not very far from the truth, you know. I go to Qatar every year, and that's it. And the people that I talk to, that I get information from, are Egyptian documentary filmmakers, Somali guards. Never anybody from the government is going to ask me my questions. Never. Oh, answer my question. Never. So, anyway, uh, Bandar impressed to the, Bush, uh, to the Obama administration, look, I am in charge now. Uh, King Abdullah told me that I have free hand in Syria. I'm the director of Saudi intelligence. I'm going to run this whole show, and I don't want these upstarts from Qatar. They have to be out. This explains why the, you know, the Syrian National Council or Council from above, all of the name that they have this week with the guy that is in charge this week before he resigns. We don't even know who these people are anymore. These are out of the picture. So now it's Bandar running the show. This explains a lot of what's going on now, including the possibility of a false flag. So Bandar Bush arrives on the scene and is coordinating much of the terrorism that is taking place in Syria, and this is another exceptionally important piece of this puzzle. And it is very interesting to see the political bedfellows that are being made in terms of the people who are all interested in seeing the destabilization that's happening in Syria right now. U.S., Israel, Qatar, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, all of them with their fingers in this pie. So it is a, a confusing and complex geopolitical situation, but at the end of the day, it's not difficult to see all of these players' interests in making sure that Syria is destabilized, in making sure that Assad and his government does not ultimately last, and that uh, Syria does not necessarily become a Sunni, uh, Sunni majority tyranny, but that it, at the very least it, it gets divided and, and moved into this ongoing sectarian struggle regardless of who's nominally in government there. So uh, very, very interesting to see all of this coalescing. And 
I would leave things there, but I think there is, of course, one more important piece of this puzzle that probably shouldn't need to be spelled out, but from time to time, it's just so obvious to a lot of us that it it tends to go over our heads that there are people out there who still don't understand the importance of this particular aspect of it. When we talk about these types of conflicts and what's behind them, we cannot fail to talk about the military-industrial complex, which really does thrive and and make its living on the blood of the innocents and really does involve these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars a year are being pumped into the militaries of various countries and including the largest military on the planet by far of course the u.s imperial army uh, is being pumped into the military industrial complex every single year and it always needs fresh blood in order to grease the skids of its uh, industrial uh, finance and also of course to justify its very existence and on that note people might be able to cast their minds back a few months uh, to my one of my recent conversations with Sibel Edmonds on this very topic and how the military industrial complex complex is very much behind much of these uh, st- much of the strife and destabilization because of course, there are people with an actual, uh, verifiable, documentable financial interest in these wars and bloodshed taking place. So let's just listen to a short extract from that conversation with Sibel Edmonds. Now, if we take the military-industrial complex and now look at that in relation to the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, the period before 9-11, between the end of the Cold War and 9-11, and, and then the period post 9-11, we, have, we get to see a lot of facts that are out there open before us that we don't need any whistleblowers for. We don't need any experts from Harvard or Yale, you know, the ones who come on NPR and they talk with their gobbledygooks. It's, it's pretty simple. You look at the graph. And when I say graph, look at the financial power or the financial value, the the dollar value network of these companies and how much business they did, okay? Uh, If you look at that graph, which you will be showing when you publish this post, I mean, that graph is very revealing. I mean, we had this several decades that with we had this wonderful excuse, the reason created perpetual war as in Cold War, that we said we need to build our defense because there is this gigantic, humongous power out there that wants to be a super power and make, you know, turn the entire world communist. They want to come and invade us here. They want to come and invade our neighbors. So we need to pile up. We need to spend all our money and build all these nuclear weapons and the chemical weapons and the military bases. And, and we spend trillions of dollars. Well, our government doesn't produce, didn't produce any of these chemical weapons or the planes or the bombs or the, or the programs or any of these things that the expenditure goes towards, it's, it's going into, they, they paid who? They paid these entities, the large ones. Let's take the top 10 companies in the United States. Let's talk about Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, you know, Northrop Grumman, and Boeing. And they said, okay, here are the money and we get these, okay? So the survival of these companies, and if you look at the net worth, the value of these companies, and they have tens of thousands of workers, employees, okay? These are gigantic companies. You're looking at worth close to $100 billion each. I mean, you're looking at a massive, massive industry. And their survival, their existence depended only on one thing, fear factor and the fear of wars, okay? So it's the war industry that is driven by the fear factor. And the fear factor was communism. And as long as we had the fear factor and as long as we had these monsters, which uh, in this case, monster, the, the Soviet Union, the communists, which again is in line with our villains and the heroes thing. We always have to have the evil country. Remember George Bush, the axis of evil, the evil communists, you know, how, how Reagan was evilizing it. You do that, the fear factor, and you have a booming war industry, okay? Trillions of dollars. And it got bigger and bigger and bigger and just became a monster. 
And then we had the end of that Soviet Union. Uh, we had the end of that communism. And this was the WTF moment for, for, for the industry because put yourself in this industry's position. You're looking at hundreds of billions of dollars of industry, okay, trillions of dollars. The fear factor that communism is taken away, the monster is gone. And, and we are looking at shrinking uh, war industry, meaning what's going to happen to tens of thousands of workers, billions of dollars of profits, okay? I mean, wouldn't you get nervous? I mean, this is our existence depended on this monster we, we, we created. And, and our mainstream media, of course, on the forefront, pounding it, making it a really big, scary monster. Gone. So you look at the graph, and then you look at the expenditure. You know, the built up during uh, Reagan era, going up and up. We're going to outspend the men. We're going to bankrupt them. We're going to spend, spend, spend. Well, yeah, we, we outspend them, all right. And they're gone. Then look what's happening to the war industry. Look at those companies between 1991, 1992 till about 2001. The expenditure is going down. You're looking at some really, really, really nervous people. They're sitting and saying, this was a great monster that we created. This was a good monster to pump up and, and, and create the fear factor around it. But next time around, we learned a lesson here. We are not going to make the same mistake. We're not going to take a monster that can be taken out like this, you know, with the Soviet Union's fall, with the Berlin Wall coming down. We need to create some kind of a monster that we never have this kind of a risk with, something that can go on forever because it's an abstract, because it's invisible. One day it's in Mali. The other, way, the other, day, is in, uh, the other day is in Sudan. It's in Iraq. Oops, they are in the caves in Afghanistan. They are in the deserts in Yemen. I mean, they are all over the globe. And how many of them are there? Who knows? Maybe 100 million, maybe 100. Nobody can put a number in them. How do you identify them? Where are their bases that we can go fry and bomb? And It can never be destroyed. Yet, these invisible, it's like amoeba. <laughs> you know? You, 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 we still take the traditional planes and traditional bombs and drop them in there, even though we have already concluded they are like amoebas, right? Well, that's for the military-industrial complex. And if you go back now and look at that graph, and see what has been happening to that industry since that day, 9-11. And this is, this, is, this is humongous. This is the largest it's ever been. And if you look at the graph, look how steep it is. Once again, Sibel Edmonds, BoilingFrogsPost.com. I will, of course, put the link into the, uh, to that video in the show notes so that you can go and watch the full interview. And again, what more needs to be said? Uh, today, we've explored a number of different aspects of why different players at the geopolitical table have an interest in seeing this Syrian war and destabilization proceed. And it can be confusing at times. There are a lot of different people involved. So I, again, will urge you to go to the show notes for this episode and to take a look at those links and to start exploring this more for yourself. Of course, I'll have more to say in the coming days and weeks. But uh, but again, it's important for us to expand our, our knowledge and understanding of what's happening beyond the cartoon politics of the chemical weapons and and even the, 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 the knee-jerk response that we have to that, which is to play into that paradigm. There are much greater geopolitical and geostrategic uh, agendas that are taking place right now and that are coalescing around Syria. And unless we understand the bigger regional game of dominance that's being played on this geopolitical chessboard, we won't understand what's really happening, what's really behind this agenda, or how to really put an end to it. So on that note, I'm going to leave things there and leave you, as always, to begin the real exploration for yourself. Once again, please use these uh, links in the show notes as a starting point for your investigation. And as always, I'm interested in hearing about the different pieces of this puzzle that you out there individually are able to uncover. 
In the meantime, I am James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And if you find this information useful, number one, please help spread it to others. And number two, I do rely on your support to keep this information coming. So of course, your subscriptions are appreciated. And in return for subscribing to the Corbett Report for as little as 100 Japanese yen a month, that's about $1 a month, you get a, a subscriber newsletter every week that includes my international forecaster editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on my DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. So it's value for value here at The Corbett Report, and I do appreciate your support. On that note, let's leave things there for this week. I'm looking forward to talking to you again next week. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report Subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.